Okay, excellent. Welcome everybody. We're really, really excited to have you here. And uh, it's the initial inaugural launch of the Open Audio Austin chapter. I'm Lisa Walker. I'm one of the organizers and the other organizers in here at Aaron and Set. And we're really, really happy that you're here tonight. And I want to thank Stacey Chang, who's right over here and many of you've been talking with, for uh, his gracious offer and, and acceptance for us to be here in this brand new facility. And it's just a, a wonderful place for design thinking. And also for uh, helping design and actually lead our, some of our activities tonight. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I also wanted to uh, speak highly of Aaron Renesek, the other two organizers. We have another organizer, Christina Bourdain. And uh, we've worked as a team together over the last six months pretty diligently to bring about this chapter. So uh, we're, we're very excited to tap into all that Austin has to offer for design thinking. So I uh, first wanted to, oh, I also wanted to tell you we're videotaping portions of this meeting, in case you're wondering, so that people who could not attend may be able to find out what happened. So I wanted to start with, um, why here, why now? Why have a, a chapter in Austin? And uh, if you might think all of you here are probably in some ways, or some of you may be dynamically involved in design thinking already, we're also the hub of innovation and creativity, and we have um, incredible expertise here, many of you in the room. But if, whether you're new or experienced in design thinking, you have a lot of talent to offer. And we're just really eager to, to tap into that, into that. So Austin's prime. I mean, if you look at a city, we're primed for becoming a chapter. But um, I want to give you something unique about our chapter. We have a very unique backstory, and we're actually unique in, in all of the 31 chapters. And so this, I'm going to share with you that story tonight. And it began uh, for me in April of 2017, which is last April, with an aha moment. You know, one of those moments where um, two plus two equals five, and you know, all of a sudden <laughs> you, you have ideas converge, and you see a whole that's, that's greater than the sum of the parts. You see a new path, and, and some things start clicking, and you get very excited about it. So um, what, what was that? Well, that's, that's the story we're going to start with. So it all began when I was born, many moons ago. And actually, you start glazing over. I actually won't tell you all my life has happened. So, but um, I started in practicing design thinking around 1986, believe it or not. That's when I started uh, my career as a public health physician at the Texas Department of Health. And from the get-go, from the outset, it was readily apparent that we could not design successful service systems without the input of the stakeholders. I mean, that was a, a critical piece. And actually, when I started at that point, that was not the status quo. That was not how things operated. So for me, it was very important for, for my entire career to bring the voice of the stakeholders to the table at the outset, from the definition, from the ideation, from the refinement, the prototyping, and, and, and the testing, all that. To, after implementation, having that quality be that so it's so it's very very important. Um, so with that background, I I really feel that you know design thinking it, it permeates so much of what you do, and I have about 30 years of stories to show the importance and the impact of design thinking in human uh, uh, health, education, social service system design. So it's a very powerful methodology. I began about 10 years ago looking into something else though. Because I was interested in design thinking and the core of empathy, I started doing the research in compassion and empathy, which I found fascinating in that the research really dovetailed and had a lot of overlap with design thinking. Uh, I took a course at Stanford in design thinking and I found after looking, looking at the two sets of research, that actually compassion and design thinking go hand in hand. They both emanate or are action-driven courses of action. 
connection, uh, they have a key ingredient of empathy at the core. So in that sense, they're sort of uh, synonymous, in other words. So as I looked into it further, one thing came clear to me is that the definition of empathy is an intriguing one. And I found that I needed to expand my personal definition, and I want to share that a little bit, because often when we talk about empathy and compassion, we think of human, you know, how we treat other people, how we maybe even treat ourselves, self-compassion. But it's rare, it's not as common, it's becoming more common, that we include that ingredient of empathy or compassion for the earth and the environment. So those are, in that sense, I wanted to expand the definition for myself, and I feel that's very important in whatever we do in design thinking, that we keep that in mind. And more and more human-centered design and sustainable design are merging in that, in that way. And you see that in products being developed out there when they say, you know, non, um, what is it, uh, organic, uh, fair trade, all the kinds of symbols people put on their products to indicate that they have, have considered those other, other pieces of the puzzle. So at this point, I was interested in compassion, so I got involved in what's called the Compassion Cities Movement. And there's over 400 compassionate cities worldwide. And uh, I decided, well, Austin's compassionate. We're doing a ton of things. We have over 6,000 nonprofits. Uh, we should be one. So I worked and we got Austin designated as a compassionate city along with some nonprofit schools, libraries. Austin has a city council resolution designating Austin as a compassionate city. And that happened in April 2016. Well, compassionate cities, they commit to an ethic of compassion and they commit to action that drives meeting local and global needs. So I, I, I was, that sort of brings me up full circle up to April of 2017 when I was involved in an open idea challenge. And I went to that, came into that challenge because I'd already explored open idea a few years back and kind of dabbled in their challenges. But this one presented an opportunity to bring sort of what I had worked on in compassion and also design thinking into the bear on this particular challenge. So the compassionate cities were part of the proposal that our project put forward. So we were lucky and we went through all stages of the challenge and I became really intimately involved with the platform, wandered all over it, looked at its ins and outs, and I discovered the city chapters, which is a great discovery because here are these cities and there's 31 now around the world that are uh, kind of saying, hey, you're, we're want to be challenging ourselves to look at local and global challenges on this platform. So I reached out to those cities and we had dialogue by virtue of the fact I was in a challenge. And so all of a sudden there was the aha moment. The aha moment came when I saw the incredible, powerful opportunity for synergy between the Compassionate Cities Movement and the Open IDEO City Chapters Movement. There's over, you know, like I said, over 400 Compassionate Cities and 31 Open IDEO Chapters. So here in Austin, I think we have it was at that aha moment that I said, okay, I'm going to uh, initiate and get going an Open Audio Austin chapter because the synergy was there, it needed to happen, and the two together could make a very powerful impact. And I thought it was an interesting new model to present because it was very unique. So I reached out then at, at that point and we got the organizer team set up. And uh, now you know we have the chapter. So um, one thing I was going to say is what does, to pull it all together, the chapter offers Compassion Austin a platform for galvanizing everybody from every walk of life, from every discipline. Many of you are from very different disciplines. To come together to address local and global challenges. That's awesome. Design thinking for social good. It's a way to do that. It's a way to actualize Compassion at Austin. Compassion at Austin offers the chapter a resolution, a sort of core city commitment to this, and also it offers a force multiplier. Anything we do and innovate here, anything we create, has an immediate force multiplier to 400 cities and, and, and more. And so it's exciting for me to see that very the huge potential and sort of new creative potential for synergy and impact that we have. And 
one thing I did is quickly, um, I loaded this up on the Open Idea chapter. I hope you go there. In the resources area, I've been loading up some, some resources, and today I just put up this one. It was a recent conference in September of 2017, and the conference or workshop was entitled Do, uh, Does Design Care? I think that's the title. Yeah. Yes, Does Design Care? And the whole workshop presentation were focused on the subject matter of how design and empathy and compassion work together. And it was interesting, there was one presentation from uh, a Dr. James Fathers, the director of Syracuse University School of Design. And it, he said, if you go about design with, um, <coughs> without an incredible sense of empathy and rigor to that and self-reflection, and understanding the importance of that core of empathy to everything you're doing and the breadth of that empathy, and keep that in mind throughout, that you're just gonna miss the mark. And he, uh, he had a, in this quote I thought was very meaningful. It was a statement by Lila Watson, an Aboriginal elder, activist, and educator from Queensland, Australia. The quote is, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So it's very powerful, and I hope you look over that literature and the research that's there because we have so much we can offer from Austin. We're at a cutting edge and uh, have a unique, emergent model to build on. We're at the cutting edge of design thinking. So when each of you participate in this, in every aspect of design thinking, that you're a key catalyst in creating a more, more compassionate community and a more compassionate world. So I want to welcome you and thank you so much for um, coming tonight and being part of this grand journey. And uh, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thank you so much. So some of you were at our outpost back in July, and you've heard a little bit about what Open IDEO is and what the platform is all about. Um, and we wanted to start back with just some of, when Open IDEO was created, they had about three results they wanted to see come out of this. And to be clear, Open IDEO and IDEO are different. IDEO is a for-profit international design firm. Open IDEO is the volunteer grassroots um, effort of that. And so first they wanted to really build awareness and inspire action. So those of you who browse the site have seen, like they have, they post these challenges where you can get involved with your community, whether it be with regards to the environment, health. Um, and so they want to do that in that way. But what's really unique about Open IDEO chapters and why we're so excited all of you are here tonight is that our success really depends on your collective interests and aspirations. So that's hopefully what we can, um, after tonight, figure out what that means for our chapter. Um, but it's just connecting with each other, right? We have creatives, entrepreneurs, educators in the room, just bring um, our collective identities together to make something good happen, right? So that was their first, um, the first result they wanted. Second is supporting project development and implementation. So what does that mean? Uh, a lot of the global challenges that Open Idea puts forward, they have sponsors for, right? So if you, um, as a chapter or as an individual, post an idea that ends up becoming a top idea, you can get funding. Right? So not only do they want to help create a collective community, they want to help support some of that implementation through the sponsors they're able to bring to the table. And finally, strengthening ecosystems um, through long-term and focused efforts. So if you look at the challenges on the site, they have different areas of health, environment, and the way that I kind of look at it as all of these different areas have barriers that require unique um, initiatives to break down, right? So they're centering the challenges around core aspects like health and environment or if you wants to point out. So they want to create a long lasting impact through the chapter in, throughout the U.S. And so if you are here tonight, you are a participant on the page. So this is a feed. It's really just a central communication. Um, you can post, we've already had people post um, different announcements, things that are related to design, to kind of share that um, with each other. But really, it's about posting on here if you have a local issue you'd like to tackle, perhaps one of the global challenges that IDEO has posted, you can express that interest here and then see if there are others like you in the organization who want to help tackle that. 
And so quickly, we we're just going to uh, just walk, just quickly walk through kind of what what it might look like to participate in a global challenge. If you're at the um, out, the outpost meeting, we did a creative brainstorming session around how to reduce the small plastic waste. And we actually started at the idea phase during that uh, process, but really, research is the first one. And so essentially, when you go to the challenges on website, you go to the research phase, and for that particular challenge, about 300 responses were made. And anything, um, it could be you talking to people in your community, personal stories, um, an article you read, something that inspires that challenge, you post on here. So um, I think right here, the, the reusable to-go cups, these were some gentlemen in uh, Taiwan who were able to reduce plastic waste by delivering uh, reusable containers, right? So anything that inspires your idea would go on the research phase. After a certain amount of time, that phase ends, and then the ideation phase begins. So that's where you're, you yourself could post an idea, or as a chapter, you could post an idea with some people that want to tackle it with you. We don't have to do things as the chapter. Not everyone has to be interested in environment, like in sustainability to participate, right? You could find, if there's a challenge with regards to homelessness, per se, if people are interested in that with you, you could find that group and post an idea um, to that phase. Review, so Open Idea will review them. So in this case, 619 ideas were reviewed and they were brought down to about 101 ideas were refined. And refinement is a really interesting place where you can, as an Open Idea member, go on there and either share feedback through comments. Um, you can even prototype that in a small way and share that from your lessons learned. And you could actually jump in on a refinement phase um, for a challenge you maybe didn't even start at at the beginning. And so you could join people in Kenya and help refine their ideas. Um, so after refinement, top ideas are selected. So in this particular case, there were three sponsors. There was a, a, a Lean MacArthur Foundation, um, the second one I've forgotten, but there were three big sponsors of this um, challenge and they collectively were able, the, just the one foundation uh, had a million dollars split between the top 16 ideas, and they were able to take that funding and help implement it in their own communities. So it's part of that part where supporting the uh, project implementation, you're selected as one of the top ideas. And finally, impact. This stays open forever on the page. So after this challenge even concludes, people are able to share what they were able to do in their own communities across the world and how it impacted them as a whole. And so essentially that is a quick run through of what we could do as a chapter or as some individuals together, but really we care about what you care about. In the rest of the meeting we're going to spend um, figuring out what your vision is for what we can accomplish. And Stacy is going to help us do that. Yeah. So welcome. Uh, yeah, she did the round of applause. Uh, so welcome, I uh, have the pleasure of hosting you at this night to help, this is not about us. We're happy to show you the space and, and chat about that for us. Um, um, I bear some relevance to this uh, only because uh, I spent the better part of 20 years uh, at IDEO, on the healthcare side of business. Uh, I came to Austin to establish this design institute as part of GTD along there. So um, we have an interest in seeing design thinking flourish, you know, the rise and success of Austin Design Week in the second year, which just a few weeks ago tells you a little bit about how open movement that is. Uh, I really appreciate Lisa sharing her story because everyone has a story about um, what design means to them and open idea is a platform where you realize some of those aspirations. So um, the exercise they asked me to run today was actually to try to gather collectively your aspirations to see if we could find some common thread and pain that we as a chapter could pursue. And so that's, I'm gonna, this is very meta, I'm gonna take you through a design thinking exercise on design thinking or the open idea uh, <laughs> we can sort of handle that recursiveness then that we're headed up to. But uh, I, uh, I want us to do a brief uh, introductory exercise. So, you know, the usual icebreakers, but we're going to do it in a little bit of a unique way if you might expect, a, you know, an organization that uh, uh, derives from IDEO. So, I want you to find somebody, maybe the one next, person sitting next to you, who you don't know that well. So if you arrived at a pair, you're not allowed to pair up. <laughs> I suspect you guys know each other pretty well. <laughs> so find someone you don't know that well, and I want you to introduce yourself only with your first name and nothing else. And then I, I'm going to give you two minutes 
to sketch using a Sharpie and your post-it pad the car that you think they drive. <laughs> no questions. It's all about your prejudgment. Okay? You have two minutes to do that, starting right now. So this is clearly a very successful icebreaker. This conversation will probably continue on for another half hour. We'll have plenty of time to have this conversation about how offended you were by their assumptions. <laughs> but I'm curious, um, did anyone get it right? Did anyone actually? Yeah, tell both of you together. You both got each other right. Did you know each other in a previous life? Yeah. <laughs> okay, tell us what you thought she drove. And I said something like a Cadillac or a Buick, and um, she, she has a station wagon, so it was pretty... The, what she described and how she drew that is not one of those brands, yeah. but it's the feeling of that. Fantastic. And what did you, drive, what did you draw for her? I drew, drew this strange thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought she might be a student, and I thought she'd want something compact. <laughs> You see, it's something uh, compact and, and um, easy to, you know, to park and everything. Good. And it turns out she doesn't have their form. Well, well not, not a suit. But you're not a suit. Well done. Yeah. All right. So there's an interesting assumption that, that brought you to Who got it completely wrong? <laughs> very, very brave of you to do that. What did you guess? So I guessed, like, Lexus, but she drives a Honda Civic. <laughs> and why did you guess Lexus? I... I think she has a vibe for that, you know, just like being, oh. being top of the game. Right We're now following a Lexus vibe. Okay, good. Um, who was happier with the car that was drawn for them than the car they actually own? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people. What, what was drawn for you? Both of you. I want to hear from you. I got a bike with a dome on it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the power. <laughs> Yeah, so I also got a bicycle. You got a bicycle, and you yeah, like no, that better than the no, car you no, drive. No. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, so as you might have suspected, this exercise wasn't just to get you guys talking, right? At the core of all design thinking, really, is this notion of empathy. And we all enter lives, we all enter every situation with assumptions. Those assumptions are not wrong. They're based on our own personal perspective. They're based on your history, the things that you've seen. And so they're not wrong. They're just your perspective, right? And part of design is about broadening your perspective. I understand the complex set of uh, notions and sort of experiences that other people have. And so now, you know, the next time you meet someone who looks like your partner, you might just think twice about the car they drive. <laughs> or you might just be pretty interested in the same. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but the idea is to open the idea, right? And so, you know, one of the things that we want to demonstrate this exercise is that there are inbred assumptions. It's not actually a wrong thing, but what you are doing now is availing yourself and being empathetic of the other person who understand them better perhaps uh, have opened your mind to the possibility that they might go something different than you thought they did, right? So that was the point. And so the success then of any large cohort of like-minded individuals, and I'll call you that because you've come on a Monday evening in the deep, dark depths of, you know, between Thanksgiving and Christmas to join us here, um, uh, to talk a little bit about what a, an IDEO, open IDEO chapter might actually be about. And the success of this chapter depends on the channeling of your own personal aspirations towards the collective whole. And that's the exercise we're actually going to walk through. So I really appreciate Lisa sharing that because that's a really poignant sort of uh, insight into the reason that she was compelled to even being establish uh, this awesome open, uh, open IDEO chapter. And so it's important to understand that. But hers is one of many. Uh, and so part of the goal here today is to actually capture your aspirations um, for what you want to get out of an idea chapter because the chapter succeeds to the extent that it fulfills those as well. All right, so we're going to talk about our collective aspiration. And as you might suspect, your tools are still a sharp <coughs> and a post it notes, right? So I'm going to give you five examples. What I, what I want you to do in the next, we're, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to build a live mind map, and, and Aaron and Lisa and I are going to sort of sort that live. We're going to do a live synthesis. So this is literally both a, like a live demonstration of design thinking and an actual uh, working project all at the same time. We'd like you to capture as many post-its as you need to capture, or only one if that's all you need, your aspiration for being part of this chapter. I'm going to give you some examples, right? And so I'm going to read you a couple of examples. 
you don't have to use these. If they capture it perfectly, then I was clairvoyant and you just copy it down, but it's probably not. Right, so here, here are examples. One, you came here to, and they're all action sort of object pairs, right? So you came here to learn about, about the design process, specifically you could fill that out. Or you came to learn about what the design community in Austin feels like. It could be anything. So you'll see on the wall there, there's one target that says learn. As you write these, we'll put them up and then we'll, we'll self sort them. The second one, don't worry, don't write this down. I'll show you the summary slide as well. The second one could be connect to other Austin design devotees by, you can finish that, right? Or you can, you can, you can write out however you want. Could be, I want to participate in global local design challenges that do something. Um, I want to implement new design interventions in, come on in, you know, by, um, implement new design interventions in, and you can fill out whatever you want to be. It could be, I want to demonstrate the impact through design by, right? Could be, I want to be recognized. If those five verbs don't capture it, come up with your own verb. Um, the important thing is, as many as you write, we want one of them to be your lead. Choose the one that means the most to you, and we're going to ask you to draw a line around it and write your name and, and, uh, and last initial on it so we can actually catch it. We want to come back, we want to know who, the, to, who they're attributed to. So if you write 15 of them, still choose one and put a border around it. If you only write one, still put a border around it because hopefully that's the one that represents what you want. So I put these back up here as examples. Uh, and we want you to essentially write as many posts as it takes to capture the zeitgeist, your aspirations, what you hope an open audio chapter will help you achieve. Okay? So, as, and, and here's the rules of how this works. The idea is not an idea until it's written. So it's giving you a fat marker and a very small piece of paper so you can't write a dissertation. <laughs> so the key is to be, is to be short and succinct. Um, and it's not an idea until it's written, and then you hold your hand up and you share it with us, and then it goes on the board. And we're gonna, we're gonna sort of live map and sort these and see what we get to in the course of the next 15 or 20 minutes. And then we have a follow on exercise for that, okay? So, we'll let you get started, and as soon as you're ready, share what you have. And the chairs are all on pivots, because we're gonna now do this. Ready, good. Your name is? I'm Val. I'm Val. 